Channel 10. <laughs> What's up, Channel 10 Podcast listeners? Before we get into today's show, we have to take care of some business first. We need you to help support the podcast by going to iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or wherever else you listen to the podcast and commenting, subscribing, rating, liking, favoriting, whatever it is that you can do. We need you to do it to help us get higher in the rankings. Also, don't forget to check out channel10podcast.com. You can leave us a comment there as well. And also you can check out our great back catalog of episodes. Also at the website, you can click on the store link and purchase is great channel 10 podcast merchandise thanks for listening we appreciate your support hit us up anytime channel 10 podcast at gmail.com channel 10 podcast.com reach out on twitter instagram soundcloud facebook however you interact and we with that, like see let's channel start 10. the show and we used to think the people would catch on <laughs> no, but if you're not from Queens <laughs> yeah, if you don't got time yeah, Warner so or whatever like, like well, I didn't know that do it, I say, yo. yo what up man it's a different again. channel son what up on man what up watch the channel son Different plane now, man. It's all good. Well, what up? All good, baby. In every it's hood, bridge. son. Well, what up? Yep. CNN, Network, Channel 10. It's on again. Network Street niggas, it's grown shit. men. Bold face, get in your face. Stay in place, yo. Crime lace. Cast more beef than Scarface. CNN, Network, Network, Network Channel 10. Network. It's on again. Street well, niggas, that's grown well, men. Bold face, get in your face. Stay in place, yo. Call is now being recorded. <laughs> yo. Yo. Yo, yo. Yo, we're back once again. It's the Channel 10 Podcast. It's your man, the almighty AR in the building, and I'm alongside... Singo Superior. And uh, today we have a very special guest. Uh, now, if you don't know his name, you've most definitely heard his work, um, you know, through uh, things like Afro Samurai... Uh, through musicianship on music from Mac 10, Aaliyah, Ice Cube, Too Short, Kanye West, movies like Django. Um, you know, this guy really should have no introduction, but he goes by the name of True James. Say what's up to the people. What's up to the people? Yep, yep. Uh, <laughs> and, um, you know, we first were introduced to, Sto- to, uh, to uh, True James uh, when his band uh, Stone Mecca um, they were playing for RZA at the 930 Club in D.C. And uh, we had the opportunity to meet True James after the show. So that was a really good experience. And so we've kept in contact here and there since then. Um, so it's definitely a blessing to have you on our podcast, man. Thanks a lot yeah. for your time. Yeah. Uh, anytime, man. You know how we go back. Yeah. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention, my AKA is actually Stone Mecca. Okay. Yeah, that's that. People call me Stone Mecca. The, the they were calling me Stone Mecca before my production name, True James. Okay, and and um, so it's kind of like um, now it's kind of reverted back to that. So just so you know, going forward. <laughs> okay, Stone Mecca. <laughs> there you go. Um, now, um, before we get you know back deep into the history, what's the uh, the significance behind the name Stone Mecca? Well, my whole mission when I wanted to get into music or start making music was to um, make something that, um, you know, I I saw the state of music and I wanted to give people something that was a a solid place. And and stone itself is a solid substance. So it was, that was the first thing that came to my mind. And then I wanted something that was, that would be like their home, like a place you go to that you can always depend on, Mm -hmm. you know? And, And if you think of that's somebody's Mecca, you know, what I mean, um, it can be any, 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 anybody's, you know, wherever they, they think of in their head where they go in there at peace. That's what kind of that's what Mecca was, you know, and, and so I put them both together and came with Stone Mecca. And um, it was always for the people, you know, it was always one of it was always want to make music for people that uh, moved them inside, something that's consistent, something they can depend on, you know, never watered down, you know, mm-hmm. so. That's kind of where the name came from. Okay. Now, going back, um, I guess back all the way to the beginning. Um, so, you came up in uh, L.A., am I correct? Yes, sir. 
Okay, so uh, when you were coming up, um, you know, what was the atmosphere like? Um, and, you know, what do you remember just, you know, from the early days, even before the music? Oh, man, you know, they've made movies about it now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? When I saw, when I first saw Boys in the Hood, man, that was my, my home life because my name was Trey. My, my first name I knew, I was the third, and everybody, my mother and everybody used to call me Trey. Mm. And the dude, the lead character was Trey. My father was like his father. He was like the father of the neighborhood, and everybody, you know, everybody came to him. And everybody was, I had, I had Doughboy, everybody was on the street. Mm. And the mm. cold part was um, Cuba used to hang out with one of, one of the guys that lived across the street from me. Mm. Before all of this, so he was telling, you know, he would come over to the hood and see everything, and then the movie kind of ended up being like my street and the name Trey and everything. We used to, we used to trip off of that, but but um, so that's kind of the background in my household. I had my mother and father there, mm-hmm. and my father was, you know, respected in the in the, he didn't take no mess. They used to call him Roscoe because he used to come outside with a shotgun if anybody was. Messing around and <laughs> so they call it Roscoe. <laughs> and you know, but he always was there for him. Like with the father that took everybody fishing on the block, it was about she was about eight or nine guys on the block. You know, a lot of them didn't have their fathers around, uh. so they came to him for advice. And you know, and he would he the first time they ever did anything like go fishing or do something like that. You know, that was with him. Mm. So I had that around the house. He played saxophone too, so. We had music, you know what I mean? It was a piano there. I used to, I had a drum set. I started playing drums when I was nine. And I got got on different instruments growing up, you know. And then when I turned um, 17, I took some money. I went, I did something. I can't, I don't think I was, you know, you had a little, wasn't paper routes, but it was like selling roses on the corner and stuff like that. Whatever it was, you know, Mm -hmm. I snapped up a little money. And went and bought my first guitar from Sears. And then I taught myself, mm-hmm. sat in the room, man, just sitting there every day, taught myself. And and um, I already knew how to play drums. So, you know, so that's kind of how everything kind of came, you know, came up out of that. Now, did your, uh, did your father um, play with a band at all or did he just play saxophone solo? Well, actually, he, he played solo, but then he also had a band couple of them growing up so when i would they'll be in the living room rehearsing and i'll be you know in elementary school about to go to i'm going to sleep and they're in there playing you know yeah. but i used to fall asleep to the music so you know when the drummer didn't show up i would go get on the drums for them mm-hmm. you know so it was always music you know from and, and everybody my grandparents and everybody else loved music a lot you know uh just listening if they didn't play mm-hmm. but they got very emotional and very deep into the feeling of music, which I recognized when I got older. I just thought that's the way it was, but I realized that it was special around my household. Mm. So it kind of introduced me to a lot of good music and, you know, molded me from there. So what were uh, some of your uh, early influences? Um, I mean, you know, growing up, of course, you had around that era you had a lot of the soul stuff that was out and you can't get no better than that I mean mm-hmm. from everybody everybody mentions of course Marvin Gaye Steve Wonder uh, Sly and the Family Stone you know Rufus and I mean all of you can go on back you know to all those people playing on the radio and albums around the house and then when I became a teenager there was um, that whole dance movement that came around so we had like Egyptian Lover and mm. and um and Planet Rock and, you know, African Babata, all them people, you know. So we had that and everybody was mixing that and doing stuff with that. So we would, you know, we would dance to that and, you know, party to that and stuff. So now, it was a lot of different influences. Now, we uh, actually had Egyptian Lover on the podcast and um, uh, he was telling us about, you know, the different parties and uh, the Uncle Jam's army that they used to oh, have man. out there. Uncle Jam's <laughs> army. Yeah. <laughs> That's an and then the Sarah dances. There's mm-hmm. an all boys school called Sarah. Everybody with the dances was real popular. They were called Sarah dances, and everybody used to go to that. And it was a bunch of stuff, man. And then the era after that, he's a little older than me, but that era after that was uh, Jam City 
and the dancing crews. And it was a bunch of us then. Like a lot of the dancers that went on tour and that were with, like behind Bobby Brown, Heart and Soul, uh, Oliver was with Madonna. Uh, we had people with different main artists that came out of these dancing crews. I ended up going on tour doing that actually because mm-hmm. we were so raw back then. We made up dances that went around the world, these crews in LA. Mm-hmm. And and uh, I remember I was in Tokyo when I was like 20 and I went into a spot and saw people doing a dance I made up in my room. Wow. You know <laughs> what I mean? And and so that whole era, that's kind of somebody wants to make a, a lot of people want to make a movie about it because people don't know what was really happening. But we all used to have crews and, and uh, Fatima, the the choreographer that that mm-hmm. choreographed everybody. I mean, Aaliyah, ja- uh, uh, Michael Jackson, everybody. She used to come to our rehearsals and learn from us. And there's a story how she got into the industry um, at a Ralph Transvet. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, video shoot she was just a dancer but she started dancing and showing up stuff she ended up being they hired her as a choreographer and that's how kind of how her career got started from what I heard but uh, she, she used to be we all used to be in crews that all knew each other back then and while everybody was dancing I always played music so I knew that was a piece of it and I just didn't want to do that but I always you know, knew I wanted to do music because mm-hmm. I felt it so deep mm-hmm. Now, so, um, now, like also around this time, um, were you around during the time of the Rodney King riots? And if so, um, how did that affect you artistically? Yeah, I definitely was around. I mean, I mean, you know, if you listen to music, like everybody's, you know, about police brutality today and all this kind of stuff because it's so seen and people are finally capturing it. But if you listen to music even before our our era, you know, way before me and all this stuff, they was talking about it in songs way back. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. About right. police beating up people. With, you know, st- all them people had songs about that, about some police beating and, and the brutality and stuff way back. But there was nobody to capture it. Nobody cared, you know. Mm-hmm. And so for Rodney King, for us was... Yeah, it was like, wow, it's captured finally. Hopefully something to happen. But it wasn't a shock that it happened. Uh. You see what I'm saying? Because we knew it happened. Shit, when I was little, we seen it and just, you know, they pull us over anything. Have us. I remember being, I was about, probably about nine. And I was playing across the street, me and my friends at this church. Somebody called the police because they thought we was breaking in the church. We were little kids, man. We were outside of the church. We weren't even in the church. About 12 police cars came up, and they all pulled out guns and was pulling us out. And I was hiding, and they find, and I came out because I didn't want them to shoot the bushes I was hiding in. So I came out, and they grabbed me a gun, had a gun straight to the front of my head, laughing and, you know, saying, well, you know, what should we do? They ask each other this and that, and they're laughing, all of them laughing together, and they just said, run home. So I just said, you got this many seconds to run home because they knew we were little, so they let us go. But So, I mean, the exposure to all of that had been going on since way before our time. And, you know, artistically, of course, I was affected by it before Rodney King. Mm-hmm. You know, during Rodney King, I was in the in the jungle. You remember in training day when they, when they said, don't go in the jungle, that he lived, he went in the jungle and they was clapping and had the pigeons flying and all that. Uh, that yeah. was a real place in L.A. called The Jungle. That was where my mm-hmm. first apartment was when I was 17. And when the Rodney King incident happened, I was living in there. I wasn't scared of nothing because it was black folks that were running around, you know, doing the stuff. So I can walk out and be cool. But I did. I can look out and see all of it happening. Saw the, the buildings on fire, uh. you know, all that stuff. and all, You know, so... You know, yeah, and for me, I wrote stuff, put it in my music, you know, and because that's the kind of artist I am. And I think that artists, you know, we paint pictures. Mm. And you know articulate. I've listened to, I've listened to your flows, man. You know just as well as I do. We paint pictures. Right. You know what I mean? And that's and and you know the industry tries to box you and make you be just like someone else when you don't you know you see painters. Painters are artists. And they have different styles. And they're allowed to have different styles. Not one painting looks like another. They all do what they do. And however it comes out, it comes out. 
Music hasn't been able to do that unless you're a true artist and you separate yourself from the masses. You know, but as artists, we do have individual ways that we're going to, you know, stroke the brush on the on the canvas. Right. Know? And that's that's not as respected as it should be, of course. But when you're a true artist, you get it. So, you know, as far as music goes, that's what I've always tried to do. I've tried not to be influenced or taken to places where, you know, I'm trying to do what this person is doing. I've actually challenged myself all my life with that, mm-hmm. you know. So, yeah, mm, that's that's uh, man, that's deep right there. Like, um, and you know, I do, I do feel like, you know, as an artist, uh, when you look back in retrospect, you know, going through history and art, like, like, like the art of the time, really tells you what's going on from the time, from you know the people at the time. So it's like, you know, you have the news stories and you have the historian's perspective. But then when you actually look at the art, you have the artist's perspective and you can really see it in a different light. So I definitely see what you're saying right there. Like, mm. um, like it's really profound. Now, um, when you talk about uh, the uh, dancing and everything, um, now, in your bio, you have um, that you you uh, went on tour with with Earth, Wind and Fire, correct? Mm-hmm. And um, you know you were a dancer for them. So how did that come to be? Like, how does someone just you know as a teenager just kind of jump out there and and you know go tour the world and go to places like Tokyo, as you stated, um, and you know do these amazing things? Well, it's like you said, step out there. I remember, I remember before when I was younger, I used to tell people to rob me and, and my friends and stuff, just do it. Like whenever we was doing something, just do it, man. Mm. And that was before Nike had just do it. It mm. was funny because I used to say that all the time. They always remind me of that, right? And I've always been that kind of person, you know. Um, and for me, a friend of mine that went to high school with me, Sir, Sir Bailey, uh, is Philip Bailey's son. Mm. And Sir called me and said they were going to have auditions to go on tour with Earth, Wind & Fire. And he wanted to go. But he knew I danced and he wanted to dance better so he can get on and go on the tour, too. So me and him hooked up and just started. I started showing him stuff. We started getting stuff together. And then it was three auditions. And he didn't make it to the second one, to the callback. But I did. And then on the third one, Earth, Wind & Fire actually came down, Maurice and all of them, and rest his soul, man. That's my, man, I didn't even know if you met, I mean, the music speaks for itself, but when you meet him, it's a whole nother power, man. Mm. You know, and I know he just passed away. So yeah. that's, that's, we've been, I've been, it's been kind of hard for me because I really want to see him one last time, mm. you know, but, um, but uh, they all came down to the audition and they picked out of the people that were left, who they wanted to go. And it was only two of us picked. And it started out, when we started, it had to have been like 100, 150 people trying to get on this tour. And, you know, this was real cool for me because of my musical background. I loved Earth, Wind & Fire and their songs and stuff. And I had a lot of respect for Maurice because I saw his solo uh, song that they had on MTV before all of this happened. And I, I was—I didn't even know he was from Earth, Wind, and Fire at the time. And I was taken by his presence and his singing and the song itself. And then when I met him and, and you know found out everything, it all came together, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was a beautiful experience because. I had seen before that with different situations, the bad side of the business, people selling, uh, paying for studio time with cocaine and shit and all this other stuff. And, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire, they are who they say they're in their song. They are in their songs, you know, so they carry themselves that way. They eat in a certain way. They respect, you know, themselves in a certain way. So you, when you're with them, you see the good side of the business. And to hear all that great music and have all those great people around me every night was, I mean, you can never ask for anything better than that, you know. And like I said, me playing music, I had my guitar with me through the whole tour. Mm-hmm. So they knew I played music, so they would let me get up and play with them, you wow. know, sound check. And then sometimes on the show, I'll be on the 
percussions with him and you know and then Sheldon Reynolds the guitar player at the time uh was like my big brother he'd teach me a couple guitar things you know here and there mm-hmm. stuff so um I mean you couldn't even ask for no better man I think that just even catapulted my belief and my vision of what I wanted to do and accomplish because I had it in my mind but when I saw it in action mm-hmm it, it 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 gave me a hunger, you know, to do that. So, mm. man, you couldn't ask for nothing better. Man. And um, and Maurice, he he also wanted to do like a solo thing with you too, right? Yeah, how you know all of this information? <laughs> <laughs> you do our research, man. Man, I don't even know if I told anybody that. <laughs> we try to find everything with each other. Yeah, that that was a trippy thing because you know it's one of those things where, you know, it's a once in a lifetime thing, and you're wondering if you're uh, uh, making the right decision because you're young. You know what I mean? And what it was was he was so impressed on tour with everything he saw. You know what I mean? And and he knew that I could be one of those stars that were out at the time. You know, what I mean, like, you know, and, and but I never wanted to be like Bobby Brown and those people. I didn't want to be no singer out there dancing and this and that. I actually was more of a musical guy. I wanted to be playing instruments, you know, from the people that I like, like Sly and Prince and them people. I saw that, you know, I, mean, I wanted to be a have my, my music sound more like that, you know. And and so, you know, he called me over when we got back. And he sat down with his pad. We were at his house and he was ready to write down stuff. So he asked me about what I want to do. And I just told him, you know, I have a band I have right now. And uh, we got a few things I'd like for you to hear that because, um, you know, I would like to go in that direction. And he kind of just was like, OK, well, all right. You know, he put down the pad and stuff because I guess for him, he saw it in another way. He wanted me to do that other thing. Mm-hmm. And um, and um, so. You know, I went on and tried to get, it's funny because I tried to record, I never recorded my band, we just would play live. Mm-hmm. And I tried it. Tried to record, I got a four track and I tried to record everybody, the songs and stuff. But then I realized then that my band couldn't play in the studio because the bass line would be off time and all off dynamic wise and the drums would be off. I'd be like, man, you know, and it kind of forced me to learn everybody else's instrument at that time so I can get the recording done. And that was what catapulted me into knowing how to play different instruments and, and being able to produce everything on my own because mm. it was out of necessity at that time. Then it became something I like to do. But um, yeah, but it never got done correctly. And then Maurice you know, he heard it and he liked it and everything. He said, okay, I'll give you guys, I'll give you, give, give you a little bit more time. But, you know, I'm, I'm your brother, man. I'll be here for you, this and this and that. And at the time, he was working with Elder Barge. I'll never forget it. I went in the studio and, and Elder Barge was in there. And we started talking. And, <laughs> and um, so it kind of, I started doing my own thing and learning myself, you know. And then me and him just became cool and things fizzled away as far as the trying to make some music stuff happen. But I was always pushing to do it my own way, you know. Mm. And so, and like, it's funny that, that, that you mentioned um, the uh, the part about the bass because you seem to be really like into bass based on uh, this one interview that you did and, and uh, where the interviewer asked you about bass specifically mm-hmm. and, how, and how you specifically liked it, liked it. So you like it to be round and thick, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's the, the sound when I'm recording in the studio, you know. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I mean, you know, being being black and having uh, the African <laughs> roots and stuff, you know, <laughs> we like drums, man. We like our drums to knock. And right. for me, being coming from the dance area and all that kind of stuff with those people I was mentioning that made the dance music and stuff, drums, man, they got to move. They got to knock in some kind of way, you know. And, you know, then on top of that, the bass gives you that groove you know and bass heavy songs from back in the day were really cool Mm. you know and then the melodic stuff but you know i i 
stage wise, I'm still more of a guitar person. I still love playing the guitar. Um, I ended up having to play bass when I did have the group together because the guy that I used to play that used to play guitar with me in uh, when my first band, uh, Corey, that was with the Stone Mecca thing when we were doing the band thing. Um, me and him played guitar when we were younger in the band. But when we were doing this thing, somebody needed to cover the bass. So I ended up playing the bass for that situation. You know. Mm-hmm. But most of the time I actually play guitar when I'm playing out. Mm-hmm. So Yeah, so it just depends. Now I saw an uh, interview with you um with um what was it, Mix magazine? And uh, you were talking about, you know, working in the studio and everything and like how you said, you know, you started off on the four track. Did you have any type of uh, technical training on uh, engineering and studio equipment or were you just just uh, jump in and, you know, kind of just do it and just learn yourself? Yes, it's it's, I'm already a tech tech kind of geek kind of do when it comes to stuff so even when i was right. younger i used to just take stuff apart put it back together figure it out mm-hmm. so and my ear for music i remember when i was young i used to hear things in music that i thought everybody else heard because i just heard it and come to find out when i got older that no you got to dig in to hear that kind of stuff i would hear stuff way in the back that was happening with the string or with this or with that so the separation of music for me was already there and um when I would get equipment, I would learn it. You know, I would try to learn my equipment so I so I won't have to spend time going through it when I was trying to create. Uh-huh. So I would learn it and then sit with it, like you said, just really dive into it and get to know it. Because you'll realize that a lot of them communicate the same way. If you get a different MIDI machine, it's going to have the same functions as this MIDI machine. Maybe a couple little extra things, but... They all communicate kind of the same way. So once you uh, dig in, you start to understand it. And um, for me, that was it was fun for me to do that, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of developed my ear as I went. And it ended up being where I use my ear and some of the technical things that I've learned Mm -hmm. to, you know, mix and master things and stuff that. Uh, uh, I didn't realize that I was doing such a good job of that until people that are professionals heard it and would ask, you know, where'd you get this mastered? Where'd you mix this? You know, and I'd be like in my living room, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know what I mean? But I didn't know at the time until someone told me Then I realized, oh, I got a little ear. I can figure this out, you know, but um, it's really about homework I think you know a lot of people just don't dig in and figure out what they're hearing and they Mm want to say call themselves producers they want to do this they want to do that but they don't want to do the homework and that's a big part of it you know you got to know what what made that sound like this and why this why you like this sound why this is doing this and you know people sample drums all the time but what are they sampling they sampling somebody that played live drums, but it was recorded a certain way and mixed and made to sound like it sounded. You see what uh-huh. I'm saying? Uh-huh. So you can do that with somebody else playing the drums. It doesn't have to be where it was a sample. You can act because if you know about the um, the frequencies of it and what, how it's working, you can dial it in and mic your stuff and make stuff come out like the sample that they sampled. You know what I mean? But now it's your own it's your own thing. Mm. So it's just digging in. Now when you first started, like um I guess delving into this world, uh, was it like did you start off on analog and move to digital or did you just start on digital? Oh man, I started on analog, man. Mm. I love analog. I wish I wish I could record everything on two inch tape. That's just mm. a totally different sound. Totally different. I mean, it's a warmth and a big fullness that you get from two inch tape from tape recording that you can never get in digital unless somebody come and master that and figure it out but um, yeah my my father growing up had a reel to reel in the house so I mean even messing with that (laughs) Mm. you know recording on that when I first recorded something you know and um, finding some 
old uh, tape machines to use when I first started. Even my four track when I first started was a cassette four track, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's a big difference in sound. Somebody explained to me like this, which was really cool back in the day. They said a digital, uh, uh, you know how you look at um, uh, uh, waves, mm-hmm. audio waves, and how they look when you record them? Mm-hmm. Yeah. They said a digital frequency wave looks like stair steps going up to make the wave, mm-hmm. right? And then back down. Yeah. And depending on if you got 24-bit, 16-bit, and all that kind of stuff depends on how that's, many stairs. How many stairs and how big they are, how wide they are apart. So that's the sound you're actually capturing. So all those other places where the stairs are not at is, is missing the sound. And they said an uh, audio wave that's uh, recorded with tape is just a straight, round wave. So it's getting everything and everything beyond it, even the air beyond it and the mm-hmm. tone, you know, and all those things that are beyond it, which makes that sound so much different. You know what I mean? So it's, it's um, you know, it's a big thing to, to, to still, I mean, if you can record with that, uh, it's still a better way to me, you know. But, you know, so like even now, um, because, you know, this is a big, uh, you know, just to get real tech nerdy with it, I guess this is a big debate. Uh, I guess, you know, people ask, you know, does it make a difference if you start with uh, the analog, with the roundness of the sound wave and then go into digital uh, where it's going to, I guess, transcribe it into the stair step? Um, you know, just for, you know, MP3 or CD purposes or whatever, uh, versus just doing it straight digital and then, you know, keeping it digital. Uh, do you think that that, uh, makes a difference? Like if you start analog and then don't play it analog, does that make a difference? Yeah. Mm. I mean, it's in the sense that you got to, you already captured a body of music Mm. and, if you apply it to the digital realm, you still have that body of music, but it's going to it's going to take away some of the sound of the full body of music. But the instrumentation and things that were captured before that are still going to they're not going to be taken away separately. You know, what I mean, mm. so, yeah, you could still get a warmer sound from that. I mean, you can hear that in today's music when people certain people still use two inch and I analog right. recordings, but they mm-hmm. end up having to sell CDs. Right. See what I'm saying? But you can still hear the difference in the music. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And the, and the quality of the music and stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, so, yeah, there is a, um, there's still a, a, a advantage to going analog whenever you can. Mm. Now, when it comes to um, you know, touring with Earth, Burning Fire and then going off into doing your own thing. Um, and then, you know, the formation of the band, uh, Stone Mecca, um, you know, and, you know, everything that transpired since then. How did, how did that, you know, take place? Like, uh, after you came off of tour and you were playing the guitar and everything, um, what direction did you, or, you know, what did you have in your mind, uh, where you wanted to go? And, uh, how did that come into fruition? Um, man, I got off a tour and I was trying to figure it out, to tell you the truth. Mm-hmm. You know, I started playing, I was playing with the band I had before, the one I had since I was, you know, a teenager or whatever. And then I moved to Atlanta because my boy was going to school out there. He was graduating from Morehouse mm-hmm. and he started a clothing line and he wanted me to come out there and help him with that. And so I went out there. We lived off of that. We toured all around the U.S. selling that. We lived off of that to different stores and all that for a while. And um, all the while, I was playing music still. You know, he played piano and stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, I met some other musicians out that way. And me and uh, Martin Luther, I called him Cisco at the time, but Martin Luther, he's a known singer out there in uh, the Bay Area and other places. He played with the Roots for a while. As a matter of fact, he was playing guitar and singing. Mm -hmm. And... um, we got together and we formed a, a group then. Uh, actually, we moved from Atlanta back to L.A. And then we moved to the Bay Area and we formed a group then. 
and it was called Hallucination. And a lot of the players now play with different people and all this kind of stuff. It was it was cool. So we started that, and it was kind of on that on that realm of where I was trying to go. But um, you know that lasted for a while, and then I was out there, and that's when the whole idea for Stone Mecca came. I met Amina, uh-huh. which is the girl singing on the first Contact album on most of the songs, and and then I met um, Alan and Kenny. Alan and Kenny were with the group Chris John. I don't know okay. if you remember them. Yeah, yeah, they were they were with Rockefeller, uh-huh. kind of Marvin Gaye feel. I ended up meeting them, and uh, we were at a it's funny because we were at Tupac's. I was at the dentist office where Tupac got his. It was the same dentist that Tupac used, and Kenny was there. And we met up, and then he got my number and everything. He was telling me about the album and all this. I ended up writing on the album and working with them. And then when that was when that was uh, over with, me and Alan, the lead singer, started writing some stuff together and everything. So the the two songs on um, First Contact, Without You and A Walk, mm-hmm. that's him singing on those. That's uh, Alan Anthony, right? That's Alan Anthony, yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, we all, we all were real good friends. We used to, you know, hang out and all that stuff, too. And then, um, so that album was born off of working with those people. And then I moved back to L.A. And we were going to start touring and stuff. Amina was supposed to come out there and all this stuff. But it ended up being where she had to move to Atlanta with her mother or something. So um, I was stuck with this music, this body of music. We had a bunch of stuff beyond the stuff that was on that album, too, that I knew was good music. And I wanted to make sure it got heard. So I packaged it up, put it out, and then the musicians that I had with with me, which was I was saying my AK at the time was Stone Maker, mm-hmm. was uh, the ones that you met on the tour. Mm-hmm. So none of them were actually on the first Contact album, mm. but they were they were performing it, and um, you know, so that's kind of how it went from there. It went, you know, I went, I've, I've gone through different stages to get to that place, you know. Now, putting, like, a band together, um, because, you know, like, just dealing in the, in the hip-hop world, a lot of times it's just solo, so you can kind of go and, you know, do what you want to do. Um, but when it comes to to creating with, with a group of people, all with, uh, I guess, different visions, different goals, and different things going on in their lives, uh, um, is that difficult, and does it create conflict and stress, or, you know, how is that process? Um, yeah, well, you know, it's work, Uh it's work. You have to be able to understand people and try to do the best you can to accommodate everyone's, you know, uh, needs and wishes, you know, without losing your vision and what you're trying to do, which is very difficult because, you know, some people just... You know, you got different personalities. Some people want to do their thing on their own. They don't. Um, they don't necessarily see. You know the in the end game. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it's hard to keep that situation going and keep it alive when you have individuals wanting to you know branch out and do their own thing, which you don't blame them for. I mean, that's what I mean. You expect it once you've been doing it for a while. But at the same time, I don't know if those days are, have come and gone. Because you remember back in the day, we had a lot of groups, a lot of bands, and it was a bunch of people. Yeah. And they were able to stick it out because I think the times unified people more. Mm-hmm. You know, and they believed in, in, in what they were doing more. But now it's a lot of, you know, every man for itself nowadays. So it's very difficult to put a unit together and have it stick. Mm-hmm. At least for the amount of time you need it to stick for it to work. So I have understanding. You know what I mean? I understand and see or overstand and see why and what, you know. But then from there, you decide what you're going to do. You know what I mean? You give it some time. If it, if it doesn't pan out, you figure it out. And I think what I've gotten to this now is 
I rather do it where I don't have to stop. Uh-huh. So if that means doing it myself or limiting the amount of people I deal with, then that that's what it will be. Because um, once you got that momentum going, you can't stop it. Yeah. But if people are around you and it, and it, the people in the thing start to separate before it gets there and all that, the momentum stops. You know, so I think that I think the solo thing, I mean, I, I mean, that's a little easier. I just think that that's you can't if, if you fail or you stop, it's on you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think that that's more of a, a sound way to do it in today's atmosphere. You know, because mm-hmm. then you don't have to depend on um I mean, for everybody, though, I even tell singers, I mean, learn how to play an instrument so you can back up your own vocals and be able to tell a producer what you want and show them, you know, give them some sounds. Don't just depend on them to give you your whole song or give you a sound because you never walk away with you, with what you actually want or what you actually hear because you're depending on somebody else to give you that. But so I think that. um I think that nowadays the atmosphere calls for you to be more of an independent artist, mm. you know, because I don't know if they will stick stick like it used to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense now. Um, now, once you formed, you, or I guess you came up with the uh, music for Stone Mecca, and then you were um, performing with uh, other musicians and everything like that. Um, you know, what was that process like? And then, you know, eventually, uh, 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 RZA from Wu-Tang heard you, correct? Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, if you can just go into that type of grind and then, you know, uh, what led up until, you know, he heard you and, 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 uh, you know, how all that transpired. Okay. Um, the, the cool thing is when you have, a body of work that people like and they actually gravitate to it. They actually truly like it. You know what I mean? And want to, and want to be a part of it. It's easier to get a group of people to get together and do stuff because they want to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, um, when I finished the first contact album, um, you know, I recorded and did everything on the album, but then I, I had um, people that I knew that I called in. Like I said, Corey that played guitar with me when I was young. Uh, Day that played boards. Um, I knew him from when I was young. Um, um, D that was on the percussions and the backgrounds and stuff. I knew him. A couple other people we auditioned. You know, so I mean, it kind of like it came together because everybody believed in the project and they believed in the music when they heard it. Because, you know, it's hard to do that if you got if people don't believe in your music, they ain't trying to do something that's independent with you, especially when you ain't paying them. You know, what right. I mean? <laughs> yeah. So so if they believe in the music and they just got to be a part of it because they see it going somewhere, then you they'll, they'll you know, come around and gather and, and want to be and want to jump on. So um, it wasn't a big deal getting that part of it together. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a demo of the music that wasn't the actual album that RZA's daughter, she was 12 at the time, her got a, got her hands on it. She would, she would be in there listening to it every day. And she loved the music and everything. So her father heard it. And um, he came to one of the shows. He saw us do a performance, early performance, and he saw it. And he came at me and was like, man, you know, I love the music. I love what you're doing. And I want, um, I want to offer you a deal you know, he said, but I, but my label won't be up uh, for another year or so. You he's, he's had to do some stuff. But um, in the meantime, you know, we'll do some stuff together and all this kind of stuff. So we ended up working together and, and um, the label never really got back up. You know, I understood how that went. I saw Wu-Tang business. So, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, it could be it depends on what it is because he's got his hand in so many st- on so many different things. Right. But um uh, uh, so we ended up doing a lot of other things together. You know, I would, um, we would, the band would write stuff and play on stuff and sing on stuff that he got going on. And, uh, I co-produced some, uh, things with him and, and, um, engineered and, and, um, mixed and, you know, and then we did 
road stuff together. We went on the Wu Tang Rock the Bells tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, a few of us played with that, and then he wanted to do a individual tour with us and just him. So that was where you guys met us, right? Yeah. And um, we did that, you know. And then we would do other shows and things together, and you know. So the relationship was cool, you know. It was, you know. I um, on my side of it, I was always wanting Stone Mecca to be, you know, pushed out in some kind of way. But um, after I saw things were running over there, and there was a lot of people there before me that hadn't been pushed out. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And that other groups and stuff that um, were still there and had been there for years. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I was like. You know, well, okay, I see what's happening over here. Uh-huh. So, um, so you know, but it, it helped us a lot, just the exposure. You know, uh-huh. but at the same time, you know, that's that's um, you need connections more than anything in the entertainment industry. You need somebody that, that uh, you need to hook up. Basically, you need somebody that knows people because. And that can make things happen. And somebody's going to put you on like that because it, it's not really about. I've watched it happen, and you've seen it too. It's not really about what you can do in a talent no more. It's about who wants to put you on and who's going to put you out. Right. That's all it really is. And, you know, we see it every day. So um, you can be the rawest people out there. You know, there are a lot of people love and all that. But if nobody puts you on or gets you to that place and makes it happen for you, you know. And, you know, especially when you're doing something different, you know, but mm. so that was kind of how that went, mm. you know. Mm. Now, uh, how did uh, Riz's daughter find uh, find you guys' album? Um, how did she get that? I gave them out to different people. Mm. Might have been my sister. My sister was um, she did different things back back in the day in the industry to more of the model side of it. So mm. it could have been that. Mm. Now were you like a um were you like a big fan uh before you uh met up with Riza and everything? My musical taste was a little different when all of that was happening. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, of course I knew the joints, you know, because if you go to the club, you know, if you have a couple of course you do the joints. Right. But at that time, I had already kind of started going towards some other music and was deep into that for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, I was on a musical journey. And um, so not fans like these ones that are out there, the diehards and all that stuff. I know I never was like that. But and that's just being honest. And uh, 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 because before that, if you would ask me about Eric B and Rakim or somebody like that, I would be like, hell yeah. You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Public Enemy. Yeah. You know, them dudes. Because, I mean, to me, still to this day, nobody can touch Rakim. Mm -hmm. I mean, to me, his flow is still today. I listen to his stuff and be like, man, did he just say, you know what I mean? Because it's. For for somebody to come out with the innovation that he came out with at the time he did, before any and you know before anybody else was doing it, you know that speaks volumes. Yeah, he really changed the flow of everything. I think he tried to model his flow off of uh, John Coltrane's. Uh, yeah, you heard about that. I was just about to say. Yeah, <laughs> he had the musical background. His whole family did music, so that's where he said he gets all of his stuff from, and maybe that's why I was so impressed. Because of the musical background I had. And when I heard him, I got it right away, man. I mean, I didn't know he was doing that, but I felt it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And then the depth of his lyrics still to this day get me. I'd be like, man, just the thought pattern behind it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so you know, that was more of who I was into before then. And then after that, when Public Enemy came and then things started dropping down to a different place after Public Enemy and stuff, I started coming away from it mm. because, you know, I was going into another musical place. And then Wu-Tang came after that. Mm. You know what I mean? So it was kind of like, um, you know, I didn't have the chance really to go into it because I was somewhere else. Mm. 
Mm. You know. But now I know all the songs, but we had to play them all the time. <laughs> <laughs> now, what's it like, um, you know, when you're dealing with sample-driven music and then you're trying to play it as a live band, what's that process like? Um, I've always been curious because I've, I've worked with uh, bands before and, you know, they, they've uh, been able to, like, pick up on things or they uh, work around certain things that may not work on the stage. But, like, what's your process on translating a track that's made in the studio into, uh, like, a performance? Well, that was that whole thing about knowing music, you know, uh-huh. and knowing your ear and knowing how to make something sound like where they got their stuff from. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? And I think that that's the difference in people that know that, that have a band that's trying to do that, than people that don't. That's just a band because they'll never be able to make it sound like where it knocks and it's hard, like what that album was like. Uh-huh. But for us, we knew how to do that. We knew how to, you know, translate it live to where we didn't lose that feeling that you got from the album. And what I wanted to do after we got that was even enhance it more. So when you see the live show, it even made you, it even hit you harder and made you feel something further than even the album itself. And I think we came across well with that because everybody that heard hip hop hands, everybody was like, man, you know, and it made the show, it made RZA feel like a rock star. I remember he just loved the band because he got to break out, mm-hmm. you know what I mean, and break it down and come up, but it still felt and, you know, sounded like what he did. Yeah. yeah. So, and I don't know if you guys remember the show, but the show was hitting when we, when we did it, you know what I mean? It wasn't nothing missing. People, you know, people were feeling it. Yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah, I remember toward the end when, um, when uh, you guys did the, uh, the fourth chamber. Oh man! Yeah, you guys got really hyped, <laughs> and, and the RZA started jumping up and down, acting like a rock star and shit. That, that was it was pretty dope. Yeah, man, because that allows you to when you have that that live music flowing with you and the people's energy flowing around you, and the, you know when we hit fourth chamber and stuff like that, we went rock, we rocked out, we just went hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so it um well, makes him get hyped too. You know, he loves yeah. it. So like um with like I guess like with like let's say uh with like a uh, fourth chamber uh how long would it take you guys to like break it down and try to figure out you know like the perfect sounds to you know to really recreate it Well luckily I was with a group of all my friends all the people that I was playing with were actually producers as well and mm-hmm. and like D he was a DJ and stuff so I mean they listened and hear things already in that ear you see what I'm saying? So it wasn't hard for them to find that sound uh-huh. and make it happen. You know, yeah. I wasn't teaching them how to do that. They they got that. You know what I mean? So that made it a whole lot easier to to I mean, you know, a couple of people I might have to go in and adjust and say, try this, try that, but uh um the fact that they already produced and knew that music and you know, knew how to make people dance and played the albums and stuff. They got it. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it was it was kind of easier for them to pick it up than just a standard musician that's not into producing and stuff. You know. Uh-huh. All right. Now, when you're uh, creating uh, certain things, do you feel like like do you feel like you're just doing the work sometimes or like, do you realize that you're actually like being a part of history? Like for instance, um, with the record on uh, eight diagrams, uh, what was it? My heart, uh, gently weeps, uh, with, uh, Erica Baidu and everything like that. Um, like I remember when that song came out, it was uh, like a really big deal. And I didn't even know that that was you on there, which was a crazy thing. Um, uh, do do you take all that in as you're doing it or do you just kind of do the work as you're doing it? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, no, yeah, I mean, it just depends because, see, when I'm doing my own stuff, I'm very creative and I'm innovating and creating stuff. But when I'm doing work in a studio, I get into it, of course. Mm-hmm. But it's it's um, it's kind of like... Um, 
at the time I get into doing it, or like like with even that song, uh-huh. we were brought in when it was nothing laid yet. I actually brought the band in to play the drums and everything, the bass, the guitar. So we were creating it in our own way from the top. We had no idea that Erica Badu was going to be on it, and uh-huh. you know, uh, he brought in um, uh, what's his name, uh, the son of the Beatles, uh, Sean Lennon. No, 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 no. What's the guitar? Uh, I know him well too. His name is just skipping my head right now. Um, is it Danny? Well, anyway, uh, um, one of the Beatles' sons. I can't remember his name right now. But um, he brought him in to play over the top of it with an acoustic guitar. And but the song was already done at that point. I think this was all this all that part comes in as the you know the the for the the promotion of it and mm-hmm. the media part of it. Let's get these names on it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So all of that happened then. So and that's kind of been the story. Mm-hmm. And the cold part is a lot of times because even before RZA and all them, when I was doing the stuff with Cube and all of them people and all of that, that was. I would come in, man, it would barely be a beat laid. And once they realize I can play all the different instruments, I ended up playing most of the instruments on the songs. Uh. And didn't know at the time, I was just getting session paid at that time, but I didn't know at the time that I can, should get writers for some stuff and all this kind of stuff, you know. So a lot of it, and they won't tell you, of course. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's called you know paying your dues. <laughs> right, right, right. So, you know, a lot of it, I didn't know what was going to end up on the song when it was being done, you know, and like, like when we did, you know how we do it by Q. Um, I was, I was out here the other day. I'm in Texas right now. And the DJ played that one on, uh, when he was playing his vinyl and I ain't heard it in years. And I remember the process, you know what I mean? I remember being there. I remember what, what it started with, what we did and how it built up. And I had to change directions too with a lot of things. Because I realized a lot of the stuff that was happening with the music after it was done was stuff that I wasn't into, uh. stuff that I wasn't believing in. You know, I mean, f- and for my sense of integrity and pride, it's never been about money for me, uh-huh. you know, because I know the influence of music on the world and on the masses and on kids and every damn thing else, because I know the influence it had over me. Uh-huh. And once I realized that some of the stuff I was playing like I said, when I went in, I didn't even know what it was going to be on it. I didn't even know, know the name of the song. I didn't know who was going to be on it, rapping on it, or whatever. And then when I would come back and hear it and hear what they were talking about, and it was stuff that I wasn't into, I realized that I was adding to that, and it was for a paycheck. Uh. So I actually had to stop and get a hustle on some other kind of way because I really don't want to pollute the world with music that I'm a part of. You know what I mean? Because there's too much pollution out there already. And I understand the effect. Most people listen to music all the time. Kids got headphones on all the time. More than any kind of entertainment media, they listen to music all the time. And if you study pumping in stuff that is negative and it pulls them in a certain direction, you know the cause and effect. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, and I really respected your stuff particularly when I heard it because I understand, I see that you understand that. You know I what I mean? It. And you and you go there in your own way. That's what I that's what that's what that's why I meant when you when I heard when I you know when I heard your stuff, I was contacting you. Yeah. And we started talking and became cool and you know and all this because I knew where your head was. And too many of us get caught up in the money and the fame. When you realize that that's not what it's about, it's life ain't about that. Because most of the rich people I know and the people I've been around that have that are not happy. Mm. They're really not happy, man. They got to do things to be happy. And 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 you know, one of the things that I always think about is, you know, one day we're not going to be here, and people are going to go back and look at our body of work and what we've done during this time while we're on this earth. And it's like, what do you want your legacy to be? You know? <laughs> yeah, man. The only reason y'all see a bio on me with those people's names and stuff I played on and all this kind of stuff is because people told me around me that I needed that to further myself 
to make other people even listen and want to look. Mm-hmm. And at that time, I really didn't want to do that. I wasn't who I was. I didn't want to do none of that, man. I didn't want to be. That was when I was learning about the industry. I didn't even know you needed all that to be a part of the industry. You know what I mean? I didn't want, you know, that, 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 uh, look at what I did. Look at who I'm with. You know what I'm saying? I don't believe in that. You yeah. Know what I mean? And, and when I'm around even those people, I think they respect me because they know I don't look at them in that way. I'm not like, ooh, look at this. I'm with this person. Yeah. They know I can give a damn. Yeah. They know I. They know that I demand respect regardless, and I'll respect you as long as you're respectful and you respect me. You know what I mean? And that's the difference right there. You know, it's, and, I, and, and too many people have it another way. You know what I mean? And, you know, that's the kind of the way of the world. I mean, you know, what you going to do? Yeah, you know? that's true. And it's like now um, there are so many different avenues that you can take. Um, I guess that's the, you know, the good part about the now. Like, um, I don't know if you're up on, you know, we have things like distro kit and things where you can get your music on the iTunes like the same day or next day and stuff like that to where you can kind of push it out more um, and, you know, kind of move independently. Um, so, you know, in terms of independent grind and everything like that, um, you know, I was just curious, you know, uh, where you at now and, you know, what you doing now, um, in terms of, you know, the music and everything, man, you know, now I'm trying to, I'm trying to enjoy myself with music because when you get caught up in the entertainment industry part of it, you become robotic in music, you know, it's not, it's not fun no more. It's, it's, it's. It becomes work. Yeah. It's like, you know, you're doing it for work. And that's not what I ever did music for. I wanted to do music for. So now I'm having fun with music. I mean, I got a couple new projects. One is my Mozzie. And that's, um, it's me and um, Maisel. And um, it's really soulful with tribal kind of beats and stuff. So we have that, and then um, I'm doing another solo thing right now that that's going in a certain direction for me. Mm-hmm. And um, I got some Stone Mecca stuff from the stuff I did before to still put out stuff mm-hmm. with Alan on it, stuff with Amino on it, uh, video stuff that I haven't put out. So this year I'm gonna focus on making sure that that's still being pushed, you know, and being put out there while I'm doing other stuff as well. That's but yeah, you, you're right. I mean, the independent thing, you got to remember, the only thing that record companies, they're like a bank. You know, that's all they really are. Because they pay, they pay just like you can pay. They use promotional companies and stuff like that that um, are independent promotional companies and stuff. So if you have the money, you can pay them. Yeah. Just like they do. Mm-hmm. The only thing is the money. That's what the record company is, is a bank. Yeah, it's like a loan. <laughs> yeah, and it's a bad interest loan. <laughs> I mean it, man. So I mean, if you can find a way to do it without that, fine. Because there are avenues now, like you said, the internet and everything that's open. Um. So, you know, that's 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 a that's a more useful approach, especially when you're doing something that's um, innovative and something that's just you. You know, what I mean, that you want to do your own thing. You know. So, um, in terms of your career thus far, uh, what are some of your your highlights or your proudest moments? Um, Earth, Wind, and Fire, mm-hmm. of course. We already talked about that. <laughs> um, and playing a uh, um, original album in front of thousands of people and getting the response that I've been able to get. Mm-hmm. That speaks highly of um, where I've come to in music because that's hard to do. I mean, I opened up and then when it come, the circle came back around. Stone Mecca ended up opening up for Earth and Earth Wind and Fire a couple times. Mm-hmm. And they don't let anybody open up for them, especially mm-hmm. nobody that's not signed or somebody that has a big name, you know. But they loved the album when they heard it. They actually let us open it up for them a couple times. And um, the response 
the audience was with us with with in, with with original music. You know what I mean? And to see Wu Tang fans change well, by the time we got to the second song. You know what I mean? First song, they like Wu Tang, yeah, whatever, y'all. You know. <laughs> I, oh, oh uh, yeah, I remember. <laughs> yeah, right? Everybody's like Wu Tang, we can give a hell. We don't care who the hell y'all. Who the hell are y'all? You know what I mean? But then by the second song, they were like, oh shit. You know what I mean? And they start grooving and get this. So to see those heads that are diehard like that change their minds and come with us, you know what I mean? It spoke, you know, a, a lot about the the effect of the music, you know. Yeah. And then, like I said, I have people that have written me from different parts of the world, like, you know, Honduras and different places in Africa and Spain and all this. Just loving the music, saying how much they want. People have gotten married to it in them places and wrote us, you know, we're getting, me and my wife are getting married to a walk and this and this and that, you know. Mm-hmm. So those accomplishments stand out to me because that lets you know that without all of the, the, the machine behind you and everybody pushing you out and everything, your music is actually touching and moving folks in some kind of way. Yeah, I mean, it definitely does. Like, I remember... You know, I bought I bought the album uh, on uh, Amazon, and you know, every once in a while, if I'm on shuffle, it uh, goes ahead and you know um, plays a joint. And I'm like, oh man, I got hit true, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, you know, just the way it starts off, you know, um, after the intro, that first song, you know, if your life's not right, come with me home. Like that song, you know, it really hits. And so, you know, I definitely, you know, still appreciate you know the album a lot. It definitely speaks volumes. So, you know, kudos to you for that. I appreciate um, it. Yeah, for sure. And um, I guess uh, getting back into the nerd aspect of it, you know, what types of uh, of uh, um, equipment and everything are you using now to uh, create, if you don't mind, uh, you know, spilling little secrets? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I still mix. I give you this much. I still mix a lot of analog uh-huh. Um, sounds like keyboards and and uh, guitars, basses, drums, with some digital things to make the sound more authentic. Uh-huh. You know, as far as recording platforms, I mean, you can use any of them. Kind of, they all run the same. It's just your preference on how the the operating system or the, the software works itself. Yeah, but um. Yeah, I try to stay true to that that side of it, you know. And um Yeah, so that's that's kinda that's kinda still the same. Mm. Yeah. So like how much equipment do you uh, usually travel around with? On the well regular? you know, I was telling somebody the other day, man, I got a mobile studio that you know, if you if you know equipment, you don't need a whole lot to do what you need to do. You can actually good, get good recordings that are studio recordings and be able to take them back home and mix them and use them. You know what I mean? You can record something in a hotel room if you know what you got and yeah. record stuff. And then you yeah. don't have to redo it again in a studio. You know, like people always thinking, you know, but you got to know your equipment. So it's not about having a lot of equipment. It's about having the right equipment mm-hmm. you know? and um, knowing how to use it. You know, so you don't have to have a whole lot. I have a rolling backpack that I can carry my whole <laughs> my whole uh, uh, traveling studio in uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and record yeah. things that sound like I did it in a big in a big studio. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know I mean, so it's just about knowing your equipment. Uh, so, um, so I, I know, like, you're in Texas right now, so are you currently, uh, like, based in Texas uh, at this moment? Yeah, I'm out here for a while, yeah. I'm, I'm working with, um, I don't know if y'all heard of uh, Job Born? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he produced uh, On and On and run the Grammy for On and On with, on, with Erica. Um, here I was out here when I got out here, and we hooked up, and we got a little situation together. And... Um, so we 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 make stuff together, and then I have a couple other people I do things with out here. And um, the music scene is ridiculous. I mean, I mean, that's a bunch of bad 
musicians and and just everybody's in the stuff but they into quality stuff mm. you know it's not like la and 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 it's the places to play and the people the appreciation for music is a lot better out here you know what i mean so as far as that goes to me la was you know kind of dried up uh-huh. <laughs> it's like but out here i've met some of the rawest people i've ever met ever played with you know Mm, yeah, like, cause, uh, oh, my bad. No, go on, go on. Oh, I mean, yeah, cause like right now, I'm I'm currently based in Oklahoma, and you know, Oklahoma has like a really uh, interesting music scene. And I know like a lot of people from Austin, um, a lot of like indie rock bands, they come uh, they come up here to play a lot um, in different venues all throughout like Norman and Oklahoma City. Yeah, I know a, I know a lot of people out here that are from Oklahoma that have come out here and stay out here and go back and forth. Yeah. So I know that that's a big thing, man, because, um, you know, like you said, Austin, that side of it. But, you know, the cold part is Dallas is the most progressive right now. Uh. Mm. You know what I mean? It's a lot of music schools out here and the people that graduate out here. It's a lot of them stay out this way and they and it's just a bunch of music stuff happening all the time. Uh-huh. Um, I know Austin has South by, South by Southwest, but I've had people move out there from L.A. and then move back. So I don't know. The atmosphere too much of uh, I mean I did South by Southwest before but I don't know the atmosphere of living there but um, yeah I know Oklahoma got some people doing stuff I know that because they come out here a lot yeah yeah so that's what's up man so uh, I guess in closing um, uh, do you have uh, anything to plug or anything that's up next for you um, that you want to get out to the people well um like I told you, I got the Mamazi project I'm working on. That's M A M A Z I, and then stay tuned for some more stuff from Stone Mecca, uh-huh. um, and then a couple other projects will be coming for me. But they can always go to the Stone Mecca Facebook page, um, my True James page is my personal one, and then the um, uh, what was I going to say? Touch the Music Records has a site that has. Um, a few of the things on we have to update it but it has a few of the things on there um but beyond that you know i rather i guess say to people you know follow follow your heart and don't be so quick to fall in with anything that's happening you know i mean make sure it's something that you like make sure you investigate you dig in and um Stay positive with it. Mm. That's some uh, some wise words to close it out on, man. Uh, I definitely appreciate you coming on our our show, man. We're definitely gonna blast this out and let you know people know. And uh, anything that you have going on, just shoot us an email and everything like that, and keep in contact. Um, we definitely enjoy this experience. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you so much. <laughs> oh man, thank you, all man. No it's doubt, fun. man. Good talking to you again, man. Shit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we ain't hollering in a minute. <laughs> yeah, man. You know, I try to, I, I try to hit you up. You know, you know, every time I hear the record and everything, I just say, you know, you know, oh yeah, true, James. Let me, let me hit you up real quick and you know, yeah. see what's going on and everything. Yeah. Um, and it's good to see you still doing everything and you know, definitely dropping some gems here. You know, definitely some words. You know, we are going through different life experiences, so I think. Um, you know, at least for me and, you know, probably a lot of people listening, um, you know, it's definitely going to hit home, you know, just, you know, follow your heart, <laughs> you know, don't follow Twitter, don't follow anything else, just do what you do. <laughs> yeah, man, don't follow all them people out there. Yeah. <laughs> follow yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And uh, this is Channel 10 Podcast. Hit us up, Channel 10 uh, channel 10 podcast.com channel 10 podcast at gmail.com iTunes SoundCloud Stitcher and everything and we out peace peace Different plane now, man. It's all good. Well, what up? All good, baby. In every hood, it's son. Well, what up? Yeah. CNN, Network Channel 10. Network. It's on again. Network. Street Network. niggas, it's grown Network. men. Whoa, face. Get in your face. Stay in place. Yo, crime lace. Cast more beef than Scarface. CNN, Network. 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 
Channel 10, it's on again. Street niggas, that's grown men. Bold face, gather your face. Stay in place, yo, crime lace. Catch more beef to Scarface.